going from Genesis to Revelation, uh, roughly chronologically. And uh, we get to Haggai now. Haggai, I remind you, is one of the uh, prophets who uh, speaks to God's people and reminds them and directs them when they've returned from Babylon. So Daniel and the Exxon, uh, the Exxon, the exile to Babylon, uh, <laughs> the Babylonian exile, ex Exxon. Um, uh, they've, the people have come back. Uh, they've been away roughly 70 years uh, in Babylon. They come back. They, uh, build, they, uh, they build the foundation of the temple. Um, the temple had been destroyed and burned to the ground in 586 B.C., so 586 years before Christ. Uh, the uh, temple was burned to the ground. So when the people come back to the land and they come back to Jerusalem, there's no temple there, just ashes. And they uh, build the foundation of the temple, the, the floor of the temple, uh, right there as they first come back in 538. Uh, but then they go back to their houses and they build their houses and they forget about building the temple. And so in 520, 18 years later, it's still just a foundation, still just a floor that's there. And uh, God's not happy with that. That's not the way things should be. And so God sends two prophets, Zechariah and Haggai, and they minister side by side and they give this message to God's people. And we see this here. We read from Haggai chapter Chapter 1. This is God's word, eternally true. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai, is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with his own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, and whatever the ground produces, on men and cattle, and on the labor of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. Here ends our reading. We have a response of thankfulness that's printed for us in our bulletins. The word of the Lord. Thanks, be to God. Thanks indeed. Let's pray. Okay is an expression um, that we have. Um, anyone know what that originally stood for? Yeah, all correct. O-L-L-K-O-R-R-E-C-T. Um, who was that? President Harding? Or... It, was, it, was, it was in a presidential campaign in the United States, and, and it was out in the, the western lands of like Indiana and Ohio and places like that. But uh, if you voted for this guy, things would be... All correct. Okay. 
Uh, but okay, it's an expression we use to mean, oh, not that, not that great or not that wonderful, but okay. How you doing, John? Okay. <laughs> it's not great. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about that. As you see, I've entitled this less gospel lesson, uh, Church First, and you'll be, quote, okay. Um, we talked about in the past couple of weeks, as we looked at Haggai, um, that God's designed for each of his people. And this is your point one, kind of a review point for us to, to get us up to speed and to keep in mind what we need to know for, for the rest of this gospel lesson. Um, God's designed for each of his people. For each of his people is his or her putting Christ's kingdom, the church, first above self. Okay, Putting Christ's kingdom, the church, first above self. And we see this in verses 2 and 3. In verse 2, the people were there. They'd been back in the promised land 18 years. And they said, oh, it's not time yet to build, you know, the Lord's temple. That's for, that's for another day. Um, but the Lord says in verses 7 through 9, uh, give careful thought to your ways. Um, go get, go up to the mountain, get some timber, and build my house. Um, and he communicates to his people, it's not okay just to be in the promised land. They were back in the promised land. That's not okay. You need to be in the promised land, and you're here for the purpose of building up the church or the temple. We're told in in uh, first, uh, first Corinthians 3.16, that the church today is the temple of God. It's where God's spirit dwells as he dwells in us. And, and so that's our job, to be putting his kingdom, uh, his uh, temple uh, first. And it's, it's here for God's pleasure. We look there at verse 8. Why is the temple there? And why is this so important that we, that we put its building first above our own paneled houses uh, from verse 4? Uh, why is that so important? It's because God says my temple is the place where I take pleasure. Uh, the temple is the place where I am given, given thanks and given honor, where I'm glorified. So we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. How the church is a place that has as its central, central purpose, not stuff about us. But we come here to honor him, to glorify him, that we might do something in worship that would bring him in pleasure. So the whole remnant, verses 12 and 14, I'm going down all these verses I've referenced for you. The whole remnant, that is everybody who returned, this little remnant of people that came back from exile and was kept safe in all the Babylonian um, uh, persecution and, and, and violence against God's people. The whole remnant takes part in the building up of the temple. He says to all of them, Go get some timber and, and, and build this thing. Build my house. Now, a couple of things. A, this is new for this week. Um, A, notice it's not just God first. And that's the distinction, and we make this distinction because we do this. We say, you know what, oh yeah, put God first. I'm going to put God first. But that's not what God is saying here. Now, you want to put God first. Okay, love him with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. But that's not what God is saying. God is saying, put my church first. And there's a distinction there. Okay? Why do we put our, the church first? Because it's the thing we can do on this earth to put him first. Right? God's not saying to his people through Haggai, hey, put myself, put, put me first. God doesn't say that. Put me first and Whenever you get time for the temple, yeah, build it. But it doesn't matter that much. He says, no, you're putting yourself first over my house. You're putting your kingdom first over my kingdom, and that is not okay. And that's why you are experiencing the Deuteronomy curses that Jim read for us in Deuteronomy 28. You plant and you don't harvest that much. You eat and you're not full. You earn money and it's like your, your purse has holes in it. These were all things. Haggai is just quoting Moses here from Deuteronomy 28. And that was their experience. They were seeking their own kingdom first. Building up their own houses first instead of God's house. And God says, consider your ways. You're experiencing the Deuteronomy 28 curses here. And so wake up. 
you have to put my house first. If you put my house first, you get Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 12. All the stuff about blessing. If you put your own house first, you, 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 you get the, the curses, the discipline. So it's not just God first, it's his kingdom, the church first. Those are your blanks there. His kingdom, the church first. And so we see this in verses 2 and 3. Don't put your own kingdom first, but put my house first. In verses 7 through 9, get that timber and build, build his house. In Ephesians 2.21, we're told that the temple, uh, that the church is his temple. In Matthew 6.33, notice Jesus doesn't say, seek me first. What does he say? But seek first his kingdom. It's the message of Haggai. Seek first his kingdom. Yes, Jesus says, love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, as Moses said in Deuteronomy 5. But how do we express that? If you care, if you love Jesus, what do you do? You seek his kingdom first. You say, how can I, how can I help your church? And that was the rebuke of Haggai to the people. If you love God, if you're grateful that he's brought you out of your exile and slavery to sin, your, your, your uh, captivity to sin, that, you, that he's brought you out of Babylon, out of the world, and into the church, if you love him, if you're grateful, build his church. And Jesus says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. His righteousness is the gospel. We seek righteousness from, from God. And that's what he gives us through faith in Jesus. And so what beyond seeking righteousness through, through faith in Jesus? He gives us righteousness. Seek first his, his kingdom. Do you see that? Jesus, like Marian, asks us to pray for, that, that we as believers would see his church as priority. He said, seek first his kingdom. His kingdom today is his church. The church is the place where Jesus is king. You go outside the church, Jesus is not king. Nobody is claiming Jesus is my king unless they're a church member. Okay, unless they're a person in the church, people outside the church. So the kingdom of God is the place, it's the church. It's where Jesus, it's where Jesus is king. So it's not God first, it's his kingdom, the church first. Um, so number one there to fill out some blanks. Hey, guy is not talking here about your individual, private Christian life and devotion to God. Now, certainly, individually and privately, be committed and devoted to God. But that's not what Haggai is talking about. That's not what Jesus is talking about in, in Matthew 6.33. Number two, what Haggai is talking about is how when you as an individual, in, you as an individual, personally devoted to God, um, when you're personally devoted to God, you're likewise devoted to the church. And that's the question Haggai calls. You're devoted to God, you're grateful that you're back in the promised land, then build the church. This is, this is what people who are devoted to God do. They build the church. Um, so we see that in verses 7 and 9. We pick up our timber, or as we talked about last week, our spiritual gifts. The things that we can do, the things that we can help the church with. We pick those up. That's our timber. And, and we build up the church through the gifts he's given us. So, so we do that. We look at uh, uh, verse, uh, uh, Matthew 6.24 speaks of, speaks of this. 6.33, we seek first his kingdom, the church. Um, so that's what you and I are to be, uh, and, and I are to be. Um, Haggai tells, you, tells us, uh, don't say you love Jesus, but don't love Jesus' church. That's biblical hogwash. That's foul. Okay? That's like telling a dad, I, I, I love you, but your kids are really, I hate them. I want to do them harm. Okay? You know how you feel as a parent when somebody says something negative about your kid, even when it's true? <laughs> okay. Um, don't believe you can be properly devoted to Jesus, but not to his church. Um, what putting the church first looks like um, involves a lot for us. You know, it involves even things like like moves. And you know, you know, you know, your 
you're free to move away. But when you move away, consider the church. Okay. Um, is there a good church here? Am I going to be spiritually starved? You know, when you move to, a, a, you know, normally you're moving to a city and there are lots of different places around town. Look at the churches before you decide where you're going to live. And you don't have to live next door to, to the, a, a good church, but you want to be in driving distance where you can fully participate in that church. Um, you know, it's putting the church, how can I contribute um, to the church? You, you, uh, you consider this on, when you go on vacation. Where can I, where can I worship when I'm, when I'm vacationing? Um, you, you start to view church in a different way. It's not, what can I get? Was church good today? That is a terrible thing to say, okay? Was church good today? Now, I, I, you know, we know what you mean. But you don't go to church for what you can get. You start looking at how can I participate and contribute to the church? Did I build up the church today in some way? By, you know, by encouraging somebody, uh, by doing something, by helping out. What, what did I do today to build up, to build up the church? Um, you start seeing the church is not part. You see it as uh, not for self, but a participation in it for the sake of others, um, looking to give or to to help others, uh, to build up Christ's church of which they are are a member. Um, as we spoke of last week, it's not uh, what do I have to give, but how much can I give in my my time, my efforts, my affections. Uh, uh, by my money. Um, we look at how we can take part in the kingdom of Christ um, and not ignore our responsibility at the same time to love our family and to do our job and that kind of thing. So God, like we talked about in the last couple of weeks, God's not asking for 100% of your time. He's asking for 100% of your heart. Okay. Um, he, he's saying, what is most important if you stripped away everything from you on this earth? Um, What's the last thing to go? And Jesus wants that answer to be him and his church. My king and my, my king and his kingdom. That's what I live for. It's the answer of Job. Take away all my stuff and even my family. Uh, but if I have Jesus and can contribute to his church, all the other stuff is up to him. Okay? And so he wants our heart 100%. But, but our contribution to the church, he just asks, asks for a part. But we want that to be of this attitude of, oh, I get to do this now. I can do this. Wow, I'm really helping out uh, in, in the church here. And, and he wants you to take joy and satisfaction in that. And then B, B, putting the church first may cause us, and this is, this is where we get at this week, it may cause us fear. We hear that, put, put the church first. Jesus says, seek first my kingdom. Hey guy says, quit building your paneled houses. Go up to the mountain and get some timber and come down and build my house. That puts fear in us. Will God take all we have, our time, energy, abilities, and etc.? And last week, and like I just spoke of you, we spoke of that. But still, how does all that work um, with Christ kingdom and the church being first in your priorities? Uh, will you be, in other words, will you be taken care of? Um, if I say, okay, God, my heart, my mind are 100% yours. You're my first priority. What will that mean for my life? And that causes us all a little bit of fear. It's like if I hand myself completely over to you, what will you do with me? You know, it's like putting all your money in one stock, one investment. Um, maybe that would work out really well. Maybe, maybe not. There's a level of trust and, and, and belief in there. But God says, as Jesus said, as a mantra all through his life to his disciples, his life here on earth, fear not. And so we're going to talk about fearing not having the church as number one in your life. Um, so number two, um, don't fear in putting the church first before self. You'll be okay. <laughs> Don't fear in putting the church before yourself. You'll be okay. A, fear this instead. And this is what God tells us to fear in this passage. Uh, fear putting yourself first before Christ's church. 
Fear that. Have that be your fear. Have that be your checkpoint. Am I putting myself first before the church? Uh-oh. That should be our, our point of fear. Um, why? Number one, contrary to our natural thinking, contrary to my natural thinking, your natural thinking, taking care of yourself first does not secure your doing well. We think if I take care of myself first, I'll be doing well, then I can help other people. And God says that's not how it works. Everything with me is counterintuitive. Give and you'll receive, he says. Um, so we see this in verse 6 and verses 9 through 11. He says, here's why you're not doing well. Here's why you're planting and your harvests are little. Here's why you've got, it seems like you've got holes in your purses. Here's why you're eating and never full. Here's why you're drinking and never, and now always still thirsty. It's because you're putting your own kingdoms first. You're paneling, you, you not only have your houses built, that's okay. But you're paneling your houses, and my house is a ruin, he says in about verse 9. That's why you're not doing okay. And he recounts these things. And if you look there, it's verses 5 and 6. He says, give, he, he, this is a sandwich. He says, give careful thought to your ways. So that's the bread. Okay. Now, why do you give careful thought to your ways? What are you to carefully think of? Look at verse 5. Give careful thought to your ways. Verse 6. You have planted much. Here's the meat of the sandwich. You've planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. And then here's the other side of the bread. Verse 7. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. It's because you're putting yourself first that you don't have enough stuff. Give careful thought to your ways. I told you in Deuteronomy 28 that if you put me first, if you put my kingdom first, I will send the rain and you'll have abundant crops and you'll, you'll lend and you will not borrow. You'll be the head and not the tail. And when that's not the case, give careful thought to your ways. When you plant and harvest little, give careful thought to your ways. That's a red flag for you that you're putting your own kingdom first. Jeremiah uh, 7.10 speaks of this as well. But, uh, you know, you, you see that in this passage, verses 6 and 9 through 9 through 11. Um, you know, it's like, you you know, and that's all stuff like you, you, you earn wages, but it, where does it go? You know, it's like putting it in one of those tree shredders. You know, that's fun, isn't it? Those tree shredders that the guys put the branches in. And that's what's happening. That's what happened with our stuff. But there are a lot of things we can really put ourselves into first. You know, as a, a young man, I really put myself into, into soccer. And, and then, you know, I, I finally reached my goal, play college soccer in three seasons out of four. I'm injured for most of the season. Um, we know a, 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 a girl who, um, uh, you know, even transferred into a better school so she could do well enough in, in high school so she could get in an Ivy League school and she, was, and she even got perfect SAT scores and she didn't get into any Ivy League schools. That's a lot of effort. Um, see, there are no guarantees in life. And we can end up putting ourselves, giving ourselves over to something first um, that doesn't pay us back because there's no guarantee. But God says, take my promise to the bank. That's what's sure. Um, you know, that's why Jesus is all through his incarnation saying, do this and you'll have treasure in heaven. We work in this life for a heavenly bank account. We're, we not only are saved, but we're also then rewarded for the things that we do. You know, Revelation tells us our deeds follow us. The things we've done for Jesus follow us and we're rewarded. And, and so it's like, you know, if he gives us two talents, we, we use those two talents as well as we can. And then he gives us more. If he gives us five, then we use those five as well. And he gives us more. And he says, to whom he who has much more will be given. And so we invest ourselves as much as we can without, we don't want to, you know, invest ourselves in the church and be a bad spouse or be a bad uh, parent or, be, you know, we, we, we want to do our responsibilities. We want to take our responsibilities at work well and work hard as for the Lord. Uh, but we want to see what we can do uh, for the Lord. That's what's 
Um, that's what's guaranteed. Um, number two, uh, why putting yourself or putting yourself before uh, God's kingdom is not wise toward having what you need. Uh, well, here's why: God is sovereign. God is sovereign. Um, the Lord does. Here's that verse from Psalms: The Lord does whatever pleases Him in the heavens and the earth, and in the seas and all their depths. God is sovereign. He's deciding what stuff you have and what stuff you don't have. He's sovereign. He's the one who's deciding that. He's, you know, the, the he, he's doing that. And so, and and he sees all things. And B, and he is the giver of every good and perfect gift, James tells us. So whatever we would put as first in our lives and give our heart to as first in our lives, that thing does not determine what gives us blessing. God above does. Every good and perfect gift comes not from my teacher or my coach, or my, uh, my boss, my company. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights above. And so we want to be uh, putting his kingdom first because we know he controls all things. Um, we would never say to our, our, our boss, and so all blessing comes from him, that's your blank there. Um, we'd never say to our boss, I think this company sucks. Um, now, can I have some more vacation time? You know, I don't really like working hard in this company, but I think I deserve a lot more vacation time. I think I deserve a raise, right? You know, we, we know that doesn't work. Um, and then C, uh, we can't say to God, likewise, your church isn't very important in my life. Will you bless me? Uh, and, and that's what God chides his people about in Jeremiah that Jim read for us. Um, God has given us everything we have physically, and he gave us his son uh, to save us eternally, um, that we now have eternal bliss, uh, not eternal judgment, condemnation, punishment. Um, we owe him all, and he tells us here, my house before your house. That's how we live as believers. The whole world lives my house before your house. That's what the individual says out in the world. My house before my company, before my everything. Um, but uh, as believers, we say God's house before my house. Uh, God says, yep, mine before yours. Um, so we want to put his house, the church, first because this makes sense in view of his generous and gracious mercy to us. That's Romans 12.1. Um, Paul says, in view of God's mercy, give your lives over as a sacrifice. In view of God's mercy. Um, we don't want to deny our Father's command for attention and devotion and then ask how to borrow his car instead of spending his time here. And you know the song, right? Well, it came from college just the other day. So much like a man I just had to say, son, I'm proud of you. Can you sit for a while? He shook his head and he said with a smile, what I really need, Dad, is to borrow the car keys. See you later. Can I have them, please? <laughs> and we see the inappropriateness of that. Now, when we listen to the whole song, we realize the father deserves it because <laughs> he's ignored his son all this time. Now his son's just ignoring him, but that's not the case with God. Um, we don't say to God, yeah, you know, your kingdom doesn't matter to me, but what I really need now is a new car. Can you give it to me? Jeremiah 2, 27, uh, the people, God's own people, say to wood, the idols they had made that were in the promised land. They say to wood, you are my father, and to stone, other idols they had made that was in the promise that was in the promised land. You gave me birth, they say to those stone idols. They have turned their backs to me, God says, and not their faces. Yet when they are in trouble, they say, Come and save us. And God replies, and here's one of the many places God is sarcastic. God replies, Where then are the gods you made for yourselves? Have them come and save you. hear the disgust in God's voice. And, and, and we're, we're not in a place like this. I know you folks. 
you're not in a place like this. But we want to be very far from that. Where we have other gods, other things that we bow down to, other things that we give ourselves over to as, as, as number one in our lives. So that, so that God, when we come to him in our time of trouble, God says, of course, I'm doing this and I, I'm delighting that you're coming and asking me. I was going to do it anyway because you love me. You put me first. All right, B. So, so we fear putting ourselves first because that's a recipe for disaster, contrary to what we would think. We fear putting ourselves first and our own personal kingdoms first because that's a recipe for want and disaster. But B, in contrast, fear instead the Lord. That's verse 12. God says, fear me. Fear instead the Lord. And, and here's what he means. Believe, believe Jesus' promise to provide for you as you put his kingdom, the church, first. And that's what God was telling his people through Haggai. Believe my promise. Don't you understand? I'll, I'll, I'll send the rain. I'll give you bountiful harvests. I'll, I'll make your you know, everything good for you. But you got to put my kingdom first. If you put my kingdom first, if you build my house, I'll do these things for you. So, number one, just acknowledge it. This takes faith. It takes faith. This is one of those things where we say, you know what? I just got to believe this is true. I just got to walk forward and say, you know what? I, I got to do this. I got to put God's house first. I got to put the church first and trust he's going to take care of me in all the ways I need taken care of that I would have done anyway. Number two, qualification. Work. <laughs> Work and earn money uh, to the best of your ability to provide for others. Uh, we're told in these various passages that we as Christians are to be people who are working. This is not a message that says, abandon your work, abandon your family. No, God says, take care of your responsibilities. But where you have opportunity, where you have availability beyond taking care of those who are depending on you, your uh, workmates and your family, beyond that, Look for opportunities. Look, and look for ways in which you can build up my church. So number three, to put it in Jesus' terms, don't serve or worship. You know in the Old Testament, the same word, serve and worship, it's the same word. And translators from Hebrew have to decide whether they're going to use the word serve, the English word serve, or the English word worship. But it's the same word. Isn't that appropriate? To serve God is to worship God. To worship God is to serve God. And this makes sense of what Paul says in, in, in uh, Romans 12, 1, that, that, that our, our, our lives are living sacrifice to him. Our lives are our worship because we're serving God in all that we do. But Jesus says don't serve or don't worship money. Don't serve or don't worship money. Go ahead and turn to Matthew 6. It's what Jim read for us. Page 685. Jesus says, don't bow down to money. Uh, don't serve money. Uh, don't serve things. Don't have it be a God to you. Um, don't have it or any other person or thing or relationship be directing your steps and your priorities. God, God alone is to direct your steps. Um, don't have money. Or your pursuit of money, and you see that there in verse uh, 24. Um, don't have money or your pursuit of money. Um, be what keeps you away from putting the church first, uh, working in Christ's church to build it up. So he says, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So number four in your outline, just keep it there open to Matthew 6 because we're going to hit that for a while because it's such a, a great expansion of what Haggai is saying in chapter 1. Uh, number four, God promises to you that if you put his kingdom of the church first, he will take care of the stuff you need. He'll take care of the stuff you need. Uh, and that's certainly the promise in Deuteronomy 28 verses 1 and 2. Uh, but it's what Jesus spends all this time in Matthew 6 talking about. Um, 
He speaks of it as well in uh, Psalm 34. But um, so just to be clear, Deuteronomy 28, 1, he said, if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, as you put the Lord first, the Lord will, uh, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of this earth. All these blessings will come true upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. The Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, to send rain on your land in season and to bless all the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but borrow from none. The Lord will make you the head, not the tail. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you will always be at the top, never at the bottom. Do not turn aside from any of the commands I give you today to the right or to the left, following other gods and serving them. Jesus has just said, here's what's most likely to be your God, money. Earning money for stuff. And, and, and you don't want that to be a God for you. You want to walk in his, you want to walk in his ways and be blessed by him. So Jesus puts it in this uh, different way in Matthew 6, 26. Look at verse 26 there, down Matthew 6. Jesus says, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And look at verse 28, middle of the verse there, verse 28. See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? See, there's that thing. You just have to believe. Just believe. God will take care of me. He'll take care of the stuff I need. And then look in verse 32. Here's the rebuke that comes from Jesus in the middle of the verse. Verse 32. He says, even the, the pagans run after all these things. That's what, that's what their first priority is. That's what they're running after. That's what they're pursuing. And your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. And then verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Psalm 34, 9 says, Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. Lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. God has promised, care for my kingdom first, and I'll provide for the stuff uh, that you need. Don't ignore my kingdom because you're worried about needing stuff. Uh, God is saying, devote uh, yourself to him as your master. Um, see how uh, our Bibles do us an injustice there. There's a break between uh, verse um, 24 and verse 25, but it's not a break in Jesus' discussion. Matthew 6, 30, you see, it's the whole discussion of birds, and the, birds of the air and, and lilies of the field is his expansion on verse 34. Don't have God as your money. Why don't have God as your money? Because God will take care of the money stuff. If you simply seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Now, number five there. Um, so no, God will provide for you when his kingdom, the church, is first in your affections. And, and, and don't worry. That's your blank there. Don't worry about physical stuff. Don't worry about physical stuff when Christ and his kingdom are first in your affections. When you're seeking first the church. So don't worry. See all the note the notations about worry. Verse 25, I tell you, do not worry uh, about f your, your body's more than food, your, your, your body's more than clothes. Verse 27, who of you by worrying can add a single hour uh, to your life? And then verse 20, why do you worry? Verse 31, so do not worry. And verse 33 at the end, all these things will be given to you as well. So don't worry. Don't worry. Now, number six, this priority will make your soul and the spiritual side of your life, the spiritual side of your life, the most important stuff, prosper. Uh, my family were uh, re-watching the show The Office, and, and we're right now in the, the, the part where 
uh, Jim, it's getting toward the end, and Jim has realized that his uh, dream from college to start this business to do with it, to deal with athletes and all this stuff, which is really just starting to boom and take off, and they're meeting with professional athletes and that kind of thing, is really starting to boom, but it's crushing his family, and his, his marriage is in danger of separation and divorce, and he has two kids, and and all this, and he, he reaches this place where he realized the stuff that really matters is at home. The stuff that really matters is at home. And, and the stuff that really matters is this important stuff, the spiritual side of our lives. The soul stuff matters. Um, when we stand before Jesus, when we die, or when he comes back, whichever comes first, he doesn't say, what job did you have? And how much money did you earn in 2011? Oh, not good enough. It's, it's not a part of the discussion. Nobody cares. We just do that stuff so we have food to eat, so we can serve him. A. Um, this priority will increase your wisdom and your understanding um, of life and, and what the right decisions are in life as they come before you. Um, as we put his kingdom first, the soul stuff of our life starts to go right. Uh, and, and we start to understand life and who we are and who God is and what we're supposed to do. And as we looked at it, when we were uh, in the book of Proverbs and the preaching from that, that the, the uh, idea of wisdom in scripture is pretty much following God's commands. 90% of wisdom is just following God's commands. And the other 10% is figuring out which of God's commands applies here. It's not this mystical, put my spiritual antennae up. Oh, I wish I had God's wisdom in this situation. It's a matter of you realizing what of God's word applies here so that I can apply it. And when you put the, the, the kingdom first, you know, it's like Jesus says, he who has more will be given. You get more understanding Okay, you're in the church, you, you, you get taught more, you read the scriptures more, you hear more, you're in fellowship more with other believers, and you get more understanding of life, and it becomes easier decisions that come before you. What's the wise thing? What's the right thing to do here? And if you're separated from all that stuff, you don't know. Because there's no command in scripture that says, buy the civic instead of the accord. Okay? But if you know scripture, then you have a place to go. Okay, so it'll increase your wisdom. Here's what God says about his word, Psalm 119, 97 to 105, uh, verse 98. Your commands, David says of God's word, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. God's commands are ever with me. David says, I have more insight than all my teachers. Insight into life. Why? For I meditate on your statutes. My meditating on your word gives me more wisdom than all my teachers, more insight into life. I understand what to do and when to do it. Um, verse 100, I have more understanding than elders, the older people in the world, for I obey your precepts. You know, there's such a thing as an old fool. And there's, an, and there's also a wise old man and a wise old woman. The difference it's knowing God's precepts and walking in them. Precepts is a, a synonym for commands. Um, verse 101, I have, kept my evil, I have kept my feet from every evil path, because he knows God's commands, that I might obey your word. Verse 102, I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me. Okay, his laws in the scriptures. How sweet are your words to my taste. And that's what happens when we know God's commands, when we know his word, when we're in the church, when we put the church first, all of a sudden we start living this out more and more, and it is sweet. We look and we say, this is wonderful. My life is better because I understand who I am, and I understand my sin nature, and I understand how I'm supposed to relate to people and what's supposed to be important in my life. And so we say, this is sweeter than, than honey or Skittles or whatever floats our boat. Therefore, David says, here's its conclusion. I hate every wrong, wrong path. I hate every wrong path 
because it makes me more foolish than my teacher, not as wise as people who are older than me. It brings me trouble. Therefore, I hate every wrong path. And verse 105, he says, Your word, O Lord, is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. So we, we put God's kingdom first, and our lives become better because our souls are in better shape. We have more wisdom about life. Decisions about what to do become easier. We get scripture, we get Jesus, we get the gospel, we get life. B. B. So the spiritual side of your life is better because you, you understand, you get more wisdom, you know what decisions to make. But B, this includes your relationships too. This includes your relationships too. Your relationships will prosper as a part of this. Um, and why, why is this? Well, a couple of reasons we can talk about. Uh, first one there, it's in your outline, because God will simply supernaturally do this in your life. God is doing supernatural things in our life, above and beyond the actual actions we take. And, and so as we put his kingdom first, he blesses our relationships. Okay? But the second thing, the second thing, um, because this priority um, uh, uh, of putting his kingdom first, uh, will, it'll make you more like Jesus. Okay, when, you, when you put the church first, you're, you're going to be shaped and conformed into the image of Jesus. You're going to be around his word more. You're going to be around his people more. You're going to be uh, 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 interacting with people about his word, and you're going to learn stuff, and you're going to see people who are older in the faith than you are and how they treat their kids or how they treat their spouse or how they approach work or, or all, all these various things, and you're going to, to grow in your wisdom, and you're going to start to understand more how to interact, how to interact with people, and you'll become more like Jesus. Um, and I put Philippians 2 in there because this is Paul. There were some people who weren't getting along in the Philippian church, uh, Euodia and Syntyche. And we hear about them at the beginning of, of chapter 4. But he prefaces his, he tells them, get along with this. Tell everybody in the church, tell Euodia and Syntyche to get along. That's what he says. But he prefaces that with this chapter 2 in Philippians of humble yourselves before one another and consider each other's interests above your own. And if you consider your, uh, the other person's interests, the, the, the interests of the people in, with whom you're in relationship, if you consider their interests above your own in your conversation, what are we going to talk about here? What's he interested in? What's she interested in? I'll bring up that conversation. So talking about me, all myself, like uh, Michael Bluth. Yes, this conversation is about you, Lindsay, he says. Um, instead of always talking about ourselves and how this relates to me, we talk about them. Ooh, that must have felt, that must have been really tough for you. See, and when we're that kind of way, and what Paul says in Philippians 2 is because that's what Jesus is about. He put our interest above his own even though it cost him his life. That's what he goes on and says in chapter 2 of Philippians, verses 5 through 8. He humbles himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so Paul says, so be humble and put each other's interests above your own. Consider not what's best for you in the situation, but what's best for that other person who's affected by you. And guess what? When you start doing that, when you start being like Jesus in this way, guess what? You have more friends. Your relationships get better. Your marriage gets better. Your relationship with your kids gets better. You know, I adore my parents. And you know why I adore my parents? Because when I needed anything, they were there. And it wasn't that they allowed me to be irresponsible. But if I needed something, they were there. And I didn't have all the gifts that my friends had and I never you know had Atari and that kind of thing which is the big thing when I, I you know I was at that age uh, but but I knew uh, they put you know my mom would stay up all night to type a paper for me because it was due that next morning so she put her need for sleep second to my need to not get a grade letter down on that paper um, and, and, and so God calls us to God calls us to be the same, but there's good result in this. When we're around the church, we become more like Jesus. When we become more like Jesus, our relationships get better because we start treating people like Jesus treated us. Okay, um, see. 
okays and quotes at, at the front of the, this gospel lesson. Uh, because as you see here, um, when you put Christ Church first, you'll be more than okay. In fact, you'll, you'll be really, really good. Uh, and that's Jesus' point in Matthew 6. Um, and this is not prosperity gospel. It's not that you'll become rich. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about your, your needs will be taken care of, but your soul will be rich. Your soul will be rich. So okay is in quotes because you will be, as you put Christ church first, more than okay. You'll be prospering right where life matters. You'll be prospering right where life matters. So John 10, 10, what we saw in our, in our bulletin, um, a declaration of the gospel. The thief comes only to kill and destroy. That's what Satan does. He tries to make other things in the church, other things in God, our priority. Because he wants to kill us and destroy us. But Jesus comes and he says, seek first my kingdom. He says, I have come that they might have life and might have it to the full. Um, so our life is to the full. Our life is enjoyable it's prosperous it's, it's 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 honey on the inside it's it's sweet it's sweet to our taste because he gives us abundance he gives us well-being where it matters um, malachi 310 god says to his people who were scared to give all that they should be giving to the lord he says this to malachi 310 test me test me god says Test me in this and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven, which is language from Deuteronomy 28. Test me in this and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. And as we know from the, the prophets, that, that, that picture of tying your donkey to the vine. I have so many grapes. My harvest is so abundant. I don't care if the donkey eats as many grapes as he wants. I don't care. He can use many grapes until he gets sick. I don't need that many. I don't have that many friends. It's like when you grow cucumbers, right? <laughs> it's like, wow, that's a lot of cucumbers. I can't eat all these. And you don't have enough friends to give them to. But God says, test me in this and see if I will not pour out so much blessing that you'll not have room enough for it. So, conclusion. Put the church first because, one, it's the appropriate and logical and right thing to do. And two, it's your means to maximize God's blessings to you. And don't be ashamed of that. God's always putting blessing out before us. And he says, just trust in me, love me, care about the stuff I care about, and test me and see if I won't throw open the heavens and pour out upon you and your life and your soul blessings. Let's pray.